Lightning Arrow might just be the best bow skill of 3.20 Crucible League. Hey, I'm Cyclin. Today I want to go over and share my Lightning Arrow Deadeye variant. Now, very quickly before we go into the actual why Lightning Arrow is good and the build guide, I want to mention that I will have a POB of course included in the description. However, the POB will not include a leveling section. I personally, I have leveled with Caustic Arrow Toxic Rain, which was fine, which wasn't, there wasn't anything bad about that, but as such, I can't make a comfortable recommendation of how to level Elemental Archer, as I haven't done that in a while, so I'm just out of the loop. I could theoretically do research and make a recommendation, but as I haven't leveled with that myself, I don't know how good it actually feels, what's good, what isn't good, what are the early uniques you want to get while leveling, so I just can't make comfortable recommendations. So I will have to refer to any Lightning Arrow League Start Guide or any leveling guide for an Elemental Archer as instead of making my own leveling section on this build guide. All right, that out of the way, let's take an actual look. So Lightning Arrow is very powerful this league. And the reason for that is it is offensive capabilities, defensive capabilities, and due to that, it's versatility. So we're going to go over each of these three things before we take a look at the actual build. First thing, the offensive capabilities and the additions it got this league. And overall, bow builds have gotten quite a significant amount of changes, which are indirect or direct buffs. For example, the first thing being this new elemental mastery. Hits have a 25 chance to treat elemental enemy a monster elemental resistances values as inverted. Now what this means is I guess on a surface level it is sometimes you do double damage but it's not exactly as that because let's take this example an enemy has for example a pinnacle boss 50% all res. Now if you apply a curse that's let's say does minus 30 they are now at 20 all res and now you have let's say 10% penetration for example from forces of nature you now have them at 10% resistances now minus 40 that is pretty good now the way this inversion works is as following first we have the total amount which is 50 we're going to reduce this with the curse by 30 so it's at 20 then we have a chance to invert it so it goes from 20 to minus 20 and now penetration applies setting it to minus 30 that is a 40% uh, resistance difference compared to without it, without the inversion. Now it's still just 1 in 4, but if you have a high attack rate and you have lightning damage, that is potential. But here becomes the very interesting thing. Because we are bow build, because we're using Sniper's Mark, all our sources of elemental resistance mitigation is penetration. So instead of 10 penetration, we have 10 and then let's say we have another 16, ignoring omniscience for this now. So let's just say 26 for this moment. So we have our 50, we apply minus 26 and it goes to 24. So this is worse than the first example. But if we now say, okay, we have a 50, we now invert it, it goes to minus 50. And then we apply our 26, it goes to minus 76. That is a huge difference. It is absurdly powerful. And again, if we have many attacks and also lightning damage, which has a high variant. So if we have a big hit and it also inverts a resistance at that moment, it's just huge chunks of damage. And the best thing is this works not just against pinnacle bosses. We don't need this for just bossing. In a map, we have the altars, for example, that gives the boss 100% res and 10% uh, max res. Well, now his 100 lightning res or 100 fire res or just 100 res, for example, gets inverted to minus 100. And then we apply our penetration. It is just huge. It just makes things so much easier. If we have the altars, oh no, it's tanky. Well, never mind. It's not tanky anymore. So it doesn't matter if he has the altar or not. We kill the boss quickly regardless. It's just really, really good. And another very powerful thing, of course, is the change to projectile behavior. Now, the way projectiles Vengeance Cascade used to work was that it, on the final hit, it had then the potential to return. But now, I, I apologize for that, but now 
the way it's worded is it returns at the final destination so it's not a hit that needs to be at the end but if the projector would just disappear but instead of disappearing it now returns to us now for things like tornado shot if i actually demonstrate that in game or caustic arrow it isn't that good because a special behavior exploding at the end of the path is now oops, i replaced the wrong thing it's now happening at the end as you can see tornado shot which at the end of travel explodes and then gets the secondary projectiles it now explodes behind us which isn't great i shot it's also just projectile behavior and then it explodes on impact making the cone which is nice but lightning arrow is it's just oh, i misplaced the wrong one again there we go but lightning arrow the special interaction of lightning arrow is it goes out, hits an enemy, and then it has additional hits around it. So the additional hits are just for the clear. So Vengeance Cascade is just straight up double damage if we have Pierce, because we pierce through the boss, pierce through the boss, goes further, then returns, pierces through the boss again, and is there for us. So if we have two enemies, that was already double damage with just a hit. But with the Vengeance Cascade now, we always gonna double our hits on the target. Because with Pierce, we are always firing in straight lines. So as long as the boss isn't moving, our projectors are going to hit them twice. It's just really great. And then of course, we also have the Wall Lightning Arrow. Now, Wall Lightning Arrow is a really great mix between having additional clear and additional single target. As for the single target part, we you fire them like barrage all at the same time or very quickly on the boss and then they fly in random directions. If it's in an arena like the cemetery boss arena or a maven's invitation arena, they're going to just get a good amount of hits in, right? But they're also really great for clear. Because if you're saying, let's say I'm in a map, I'm already using Pierce, so my single target is going in a straight line or in a cone in this direction and then behind me, you can now fire a ball lightning arrow and it zers around here, zers around here a bit and over there. It just is random in directions and the more projectiles you have, this means the better average coverage you have and it can help you with clearing legions, clearing breaches while you fire in one direction, the ball lightning arrow is zering around in another one. And this combination means that uh, again, this combination of the mastery, the changes to wall lightning arrow, the changes to Ven vengeance cascade is giving us a lot of damage for very little investment. My first build version was 10 divines, had no headhunter, had no omniscience, had the bow I'm still using at this point was it's the same bow I started with. I had poised prism and I was full clearing legions. It was ridiculous how powerful the build is at no budget or very low budget. And then it can transition. Every upgrade is very noticeable and you just get stronger and stronger, faster, faster, better clear, better quality of life. This build has been a lot of fun to play with. I'm really happy with choosing Lightning Arrow. I consider it transitioning to Snail Shot. And I mean on a very, very high investment version where you have like a physical bow that is perfect with fracture with plus two arrows tornado shot is going to outvalue lightning arrow but in anything before that lightning was just going to be so good because you don't need any investment and then again this means now to the second stage it has better uh, you have easier time investing into defensive layer into survivability and again getting more versatility out of the build which we get to in a bit so for survivability, there's also huge new changes that makes this build very, very good. The two very notable changes are two masteries, which we have both right next to each other. The first thing is Instant Leech. Instant Leech is huge. I haven't played with old Instant Leech, I only heard about it, but with this new one, I can imagine how powerful it is. Let's say you're doing a thousand damage then 10% of your 1000 damage is, well, 100. So you have 100 life on hit and mana on hit. For that, the best we had was like 50 with a Vitality Watcher's Eye, with a Claw and with a small note here. You had like maybe 50 life on hit, which isn't bad. But now we're doing millions of damage in a map. So we have thousands of life on hit. This is just absurd. We have instantly filled our mana, instantly filled our life. 
just and then on top we still have the normal leech in case it isn't instantly fully filled or we use something like petrified blood so it isn't insta filled or we use progenesis so we have delayed damage it is just huge how good this is on an evasion based build with no armor with just best suppression evasion this you can easily get to level 99 now and now we get to the next thing this flask mastery which is actually hidden by my head i apologize this flask mastery we cover four percent of life when you use a flask it used to be an ascendancy and a very expensive one with forbidden flame and flash jewels so before that we didn't really had an easy option to get it and now it, we just get it on a mastery four points is all it takes and that isn't really big of an investment because those points are still good giving us flask charges gained and a bit of flask effect and you lose charge used and if we combine that with flasks that have charges when we're getting hit we're now looking at flasks that are going to refill very quickly while we kill and while we are getting hit going to get used recover for life and we just don't need a life flask anymore it is huge survivability again and again it couple it couples up really well with petrified blood or progenesis and giving us a really tanky build with almost no investment of course it's a flask do cost something to get with proper walls by no means that is going to be cheap but it's just once we have the decent flask which we want anyway this mastery on top is just making it so much better it is ridiculous how much survivability we can get with very little hard to get stuff just really really good of course there are a few more masteries which we're going to cut uh, covered later that we want to keep or that's good to use but this again the survivability layers this damage layers this easy access to those makes this build very versatile i've been if you take a look at my stash i've been magic finding just having Greets Embrace, Boots, but, or Two Rings, even with Divination Distillate. I've just been full on magic finding with the build and I was doing fine. I was dying from time to time. This is by no means immortal, but it is very powerful. And I just like versatile builds. I can't, I don't know how else to say this. If your build is versatile, this means you want to do a different strategy. Let's say you want to do bossing. While I haven't done bossing with this build, I think invitation running this build can definitely run invitations with Vention Cascade, Sniper's Mark, and a decent bow. This is going to do a lot of single target damage. We can easily do bossing with this. So, or well, potentially do bossing with this. I haven't tested it. I'm not guaranteeing it's good at bossing, but it should be very good at bossing. So we, instead of making a bosser build, I can just use this build. I want to do magic finding. Well, I already know I can use this build. I want to play with an aura bot, but again, get some magic finding build, adjust your hours to be heralds instead of petrified blood and purity of elements, and you're good to go again. Or I want to do hard content. Well, I run 80% daily on this, or with magic find gear 60% daily. This build is just so versatile, you can adjust it, and almost all spots are flexible. I guess you, your bow is, uh, does need a good amount of elemental damage, your amulet should be omniscient, so you have easy access to a good amount of resistances and penetration. And then the gloves are on a high investment version, a heavy recommendation on Camp Spirit because of the rage and you have access to Berserk. But otherwise, you can use a Mage Blood, you can use a Headhunter, you can use a Rare Build, you can use a Viscose Leash, you can use Magic Find Gear, you can use a Poised Prism, you can use Rampage Gloves, you can use a Gull. You have a lot of uh, just flexible spots on this building. You can adjust it to be based on your favorite playstyle. And this is what it makes so great. Just overall a really good build. But with all that said, if you're not convinced that Lightning Arrow is a good build for you, don't know what else to say. So let's just get into the actual build guide. Alright, we're going to start with our choice of Bandits and Pantheon. Now the Bandits, we just have to kill all. Actually, let me zoom in so you have a bit better view of this. We need to kill all Bandits. It is really hard to not kill all bandits and still get the most out of this build because we need all the passive points. The next thing is on the major quad. We want early on to get Soul of the Brian King. Soul of the Brian King is going to give us freeze immunity until we have access to an ancestral vision and a mix of resist uh, in the mix of gear and tree to get our 100% avoidance or using a purity of elements. Once we have our avoidance or elemental avoidance, we can easily use Soul of Lunaris for additional physical mitigation, which is good to go. And then we have the Minor God. It's 
it's a must have. Sula the Everest Burning Bond immunity is just so good to have. I don't know if we have anything that's better than this at the moment. But I don't really want to switch off it. It's just so good. Right. As for Sensi, this is my big recommendation. While you can adjust this by any means, go for it. But this version is the most powerful combination of Essency I've noticed. Far shot for a good amount of more damage. Then combining it with endless munition because additional projectiles with Pierce, which is, um, which I get to in a bit, why we use Pierce, with Pierce, with focal point and gathering winds, giving us just a lot of attacks, a lot of damage, and also additional projectile means a bigger cone. So we have the cone in front of us and we have the cone behind us. And the bit more projectiles we have, the better the cone, the better our hit is. Because we are using peers for better single target damage and also having clear so we don't need clear support. I think I wanted to mention that earlier but forgot so I'm going to quickly mention this now. Having access to peers on this build with on the tree means we don't need chain, we don't need fork for our clear. And also our single target is because of peers invention cascade, that part I did mention is really good. So now we have clear based peers, which means our single target, our totems can help us with clear too, because we are already using the peers. We can just help uh, use them for helping with the damage for something like a legion, just place the totems down in the middle and start spinning your cursor and just firing in all directions. It's just really, really good. But yeah, as if you want to use Forbidden Flame and Forbidden Flash, there are few nodes that I can recommend. You could argue to get Ricochet or any of the four used to get Chain on your setup. However, if you have any Pierce remaining in a projectile, it cannot Chain yet. So even if it collides with the terrain, it won't be able to use the Chain to if, chain off the terrain. Another alternative, of course, you could argue with Master Surgeon to get the Life Flask Enduring one. However, as we have the last mastery, we don't really need that. If you like it, you can go for it. Another alternative is Master Alchemist, so we don't need avoidance. So if we have the life mask mastery and our flask are getting used, so we have a 50% chance to basically double use our flask, recovering 8 life instead of 4. So that's also really good to have and also removes the environments. But the best choice in my opinion is Avatar of the Slaughter. If you have Forbidden Flame and Flash, if you have the spots open, if you can afford it. Avatar of the Slaughter gives us everything. It gives us movement speed, it gives us damage, it gives us attack speed and it gives us evasion rating for survivability. It's just a really great node and we want to go for Frenzy Chargers regardless for the bonus they give. But yeah. So for the rest of the passive trees, we have different versions, low, effing, and high investment. I'm not going to go over every node. Most of them are self-explanationary, life, resistance, uh, life, defenses, damage, crit multi, reservation efficiency. However, I'm going to go over some of the significant points in the different versions. One very significant point is an inspired learning spot. We could argue with the spot over here. However, this spot is giving us more. It gives us a frenzy charge. It gives us the life. It gives us the pre uh, precision. And also it gives us a very easy access to the force node, which is the power charge. Once we don't need the inspired learning anymore, we don't need the power charge node anymore, but it's an additional point on top of nodes that we want to get anyway to get an inspired learning working. Another significant thing, of course, is the Leech Mastery and the Elemental Mastery. Then early on, we do need a lot of intelligence. So we take Prowess, Thief's Craft, and Primal Spirit to get our stats to a 1 in 10. So we're able to use all our important gems. And then we just have basic other stuff. One more thing that's very interesting is this Totem Mastery. 60% increased global critical strike chance if you summon the Totem recently. This does mean that in an early stage where we are still using our totems a lot, we just get 60% crit chance on top. And that is a good thing to have. Because we did lose uh, evasion, uh, spell suppression into crit uh, additional crit chance. But yeah, on the, the last thing on the low investment I need to mention is over here. The totem damage nodes and attack speed nodes for totems here are nice to have. However, if you notice that your totems are dying too quickly and you can actually do damage with them, take the left path and use this to actually have your totems survive a bit longer so they can do more damage. Now, on the Omni version is some things like the lucky spell suppression chance if your spell suppression isn't kept with the changes. 
or of course once you're on omniscience taking the dexterity wheel here with percentage dex and the dex mastery those are self-explanation glory things but one thing i need to mention which is both on the omni and high investment is the timeless jewel now many people are still looking for timeless jewels on lethal pride which gives you strength percentage strength gives you double damage chance and gives you intimidation which is fairly good however i would say a lot of people are sleeping on brutal restraint brutal restraint can give you projectile damage elemental damage percentage dexterity base dexterity but it also can give you two things that are very powerful the first one being straight up on slot on kill people pay a lot of money to get a synthesized ring with onslaught on kill while well, they could just use a brutal restraint and get it on the tree for free because we are looking at brutal strains that are only using nodes that we already use anyway this is a really great node for just really great stats now this this specifically 5541 and 1281 both give onslaught on kill Alchemist Genius, which works really well with the Flask Mastery, giving us more charges gained. And on top of that, giving us uh, with the 11281 10% dexterity and the 5541 15% dexterity. So for munitions, really great, or for deck stacking, really great. And then giving us one, uh, the 5541 giving us 40% elemental damage. For example, on Master Fletcher and on Quick Step, and the other one giving us 40% projectile damage. So both really great jewels. Now, because of me making this video, they might go up in price, but this is at least a fair chance for everybody. Everybody knows now they exist, they're good to use, and you can go and grab them if you are able to afford them. I don't know how much they're going to cost after this. I want to say I take no responsibility, but because I'm showing them now, I guess I am taking the responsibility. But anyway, another significant upgrade you can get on your tree is a Sweat of Hope. The Sweat of Hope is really powerful. Despite giving us negative resistances, or well, minus resistance, we still are going to be kept. It gives us access to more life on higher killer on Blood Siphon. It gives us accuracy rating with Pass of the Hunter. It gives us a bit better passive point usage by getting us direct access to finesse, quick step, weapon artistry if you want the movement speed and the attack speed of it, uh, combined with of course the brutal restraint and then aspect of the links which again with this brutal restraint is especially good because it also gives you more life and also if you're looking for physical you can get access to master of blades can get access of will of blades and if you have spare points you can also get access to perfectionist which has actually more elemental damage on this specific jewel and also gives you movement speed which is a nice thing to have so master uh sweat of hope is really just a really great pickup if you can afford it of course the last thing to note which is different to previous leagues because of our leech mastery we do want no longer a double leech Eight passive jewel we can either go for a stat jewel or we could go for arcing shots feeds of fuel because it's still very good giving us damage and attack speed and martial pros giving us damage attack speed and accuracy rating and then the new thing is the arcing shot arcing shot because we are already using far shot we are already using long shot and having big travel distance on our projectiles especially with vengeance cascade getting additional crit chance up to 100 is also really good to have giving us more consistent crits and then also we have the potential of a small reservation cluster so we can fit our all our auras in the latest version of the build but yeah the rest of the tree as already said fairly self-explanationary life crit chance damage and reservation efficiency so let's take an actual look at the skill uh, skill jump sections I've added an early map section for if you want to do and get to this as quick as possible uh, but also don't have much of an investment you can uh, start with the early maps and then quickly transition into the low investment setup but I'm going to start with the low investment as there aren't much of a difference between early maps and low investment. So in low investment we have a six link mirage archer lightning arrow 
using of course the vault version and then gmp gmp is the same reason why we want additional projectiles being a bigger cone with spears meaning more coverage which is good for us and also it means more projectiles for wall lightning arrow which also means better coverage better single target gmp is just really great for us even despite the reduced damage it gives then we have of course other links trinity elemental damage inspiration and then either mirage archer or more damage if you don't like mirage archer you can take like crit damage crit chance here then we have totems those are now with crit damage but the important thing is the focus ballista ballista totem combination giving you access to a lot uh, of a, a quick attack totems that attack whenever you attack and also focus attack so they aren't attacking randomly but always where you're shooting just helping you with getting the single target damage out and combining it with elemental damage attack and inspiration for damage and now another great addition which is mana forged arrows Mana Forged Arrows is really great because with the combination of Mana Forged Arrow, Frenzy and Power Charge and Crit, we are guaranteeing Power Charge and Frenzy Charge uptime on all content, on bosses and on mapping. Of course, if we one-shot bosses, we don't need them, but we already have enough damage then anyway. But overall, this is just giving us a good amount of Frenzy, uh, well, basically the perfect uptime on Frenzy and Power Charges after a few seconds into the map. Then our auras of choice early on are going to be Anger and Grace. But now you could argue I don't need Anger early on, I need survivability, I need determination. Well the issue is because of our tight, an early state of our tight budget, we want to spend as little as possible. We aren't guaranteeing 155 strength so we can't fit a level 20 determination. So opting for the damage or offense of the best defense, we're going to take anger to better kill enemies. Then we have Sniper's Mark on hit, Castman damage taking steel skin, and mobility skill of our choice. I recommend either Flame Dish or Blink Arrow. Early on, we are still going to use Blood Rage for the additional attack speed. And then we have Berserk if we are using the Camp Spirit Gloves. And early on, we have some alternatives I'm going to get to in a moment. And then once we get to higher version, some things that change is specifically is the aura setup. In the Omni version, uh, with the MFing version, we want to use petrified blood and purity of elements. Purity of elements, of course, so we are in case we have an aura board, or even if we are solo, in, to have an easy time with our resistances. Also having an easy time with the player debuffs that reduces our resistances. And lastly, being still a mental avoidance immune, for example, like the reflecting chill and shock to us, or being just chill, shock, or from delirium, those freeze rays that just can't perma-freeze you. We just don't want none of that. And then we have Petrified Blood for survivability. It is and also having uptime on Divination Distillate because we now can't insta-leech above Half-Life. So we have that puffer when if we are about 60%, um, wait, if we are about of 60% unreserved life, we have a buffer so we can keep our Divination Distillate up at all times. And then to reserve our mana to that, or our life to that point, we can use Precision, Vitality, and Anomalous Blood and Sand important is that the blood and sand has to be anomalous and in a sand stance and we are using the mastery for projectile speed also affects damage so we have just 23 projectile speed and 20 projectile damage because we want to reserve that life anyway and then we get to the high investment version where we can start getting awakened skill gems it is really the same as low investment just that we changed our aura setup now trying to fit in determination precision and vitality on our mana if you don't have all the investment yet determination isn't a must at this point we with the life mastery with the instant leech just having grace precision and vitality which is actually what i'm using in game right now is more than enough and then we also can once we are using determination we can add a molten shell on left click for additional survivability of course and then once at this point we definitely want to keep berserker because we are going to use camp's vision um camp spirit not vision to just have a lot of rage uptime at all point and berserk is just giving us a huge amount of movement speed and also survivability and also damage now getting to the gems uh, the gear setup early on we have two options we can go a bit more consistent with something like vault uh, vault vision and camp spirit 
Volt's Vision, if we're not using anything corrupted, giving us a 400 life region, which is for rage region. So we have a good amount of rage uptime. Or we could go with a more explosive variant that has higher highs and lower lows, where we would have something like the Gull with shrines, mobility shrine, damage shrines, resistance shrines, and combining it with shadow and dust to get rampage and a lot of crit. So we have if we can keep our rampage up we are very fast we are very quick we are very high damage but if we lose it of course we need to start getting a new and for that the rage variant is a bit more consistent which is why on later versions we are also going to stick with the camp spirit and the rage variant on magic finding we need maybe a little bit more damage so i already added our potential upgrade with a fractured quiver here and adding a recent uh, uh, Re a decent rare helmet words can be hard sorry a decent rare helmet to this however you don't necessarily need those i didn't use a really good quiver i just used a random quiver with life and resistances and a bit of damage and was fine and i used a rare helmet that just had the implicit and then a random life and resistances roll which was also fine so they aren't needed i just added them here because those do help out with survivability on the magic find version Otherwise, just Greed's Embrace, Gold Worm, Venter's Gamble, Pariah for all the magic find, and of course, Divination Distillate, again, with the Petrified Blood interaction, having a lot of uptime, needing to be pressed about every five seconds. And then we are good to go with all the additional quantity and rarity we have. And now we get to the interesting part, which is the high investment. To note, we don't need all high investment upgrades at once. Every single upgrade is going to be significant and we're going to be able to feel it. And I've made a rough recommendation which steps you could do the upgrades. So we can start with getting our omniscience, getting to roughly 900 to 930 omniscience with 23 or 22. We would need a bit more so we can fit uh, use our spine bow if we are using it. If you use not a spine bow basis, you like need a bit less omniscience. For example, with the Steelwood Bow, I think I only needed 900 omniscience. I was able to use the 22% wall on omniscience. So just when you want to upgrade to omniscience, make an import on your current character, add omniscience to it and see once you've made the dexterity, ascendancy and the brutal restraint, if you still need more uh, omniscience or if you're good to go. And based on that, buy a 23, 22 roll or get more omniscience, uh, more stats on your gear. And then we can upgrade our quiver to a fractured quiver with a one plus one bow. You have two options here. The, you can buy an expensive plus one base and have a very cheap crafting process where you're just going to use essence for crit multi, volatile you get decent bow damage and life. Or you could go a bit more expensive crafting. You could start with, for example, a crit multi fracture. Then use, for example, an essence of lightning damage to attacks until you roll your bow, dam uh, bow projectile. And then use suffix can uh, sorry. Then use cannon wall attacks and exalt slam your quiver until you get a decent life and a decent uh, bow damage. And now we get to the bigger upgrades. One of the big upgrades, of course, being our body armor and our boots with avoidance, so we don't need ancestral vision anymore. So we're looking for something on the body armor, fractured spare suppression or fractured chaos rest and then rolling it till it has a decent strength roll and a decent life roll and hoping that the Iceling Slam doesn't take the life roll and giving us avoidance instead. And then of course of implicits we can get uh, Aura Effect and we can get Grace Aura Effect. And on the boots we can do similar, getting a decent suffix fracture, then getting decent Chaos Rest, spell Suppression on it. And then using suffix can be changed, Veiled Chaos until we hit uh, movement speed with more movement speed because we already get onslaught on our brutal restraint we already get a elemental avoidance immunity we don't need the chill version so just more movement speed for faster maps and we can combine it with more avoidance on the prefix and the life craft and we are good to go on the boots and with this combination we now have a lot of life a lot of spell suppression a lot of avoidance and we free up the gem spot so we can actually fit forbidden flame forbidden flesh easily and after that there is really not a big any more big upgrades except the bow of course we can get at this point i recommend getting the helmet you can go for a proper helmet earlier but at this point i think it's a it's the right spot to get the helmet as it gives the most here 
Now early on a good helmet enchantment I would say is getting the plus two arrow. But later on getting the berserk effect is going to be uh, not plus two arrow is a plus two hits on lightning arrow. So in a big packs you are having low damage you have more hits so you overall have more damage. And later on the berserk effect is giving you better movement speed better survivability better damage It's just going to be the better enchantment later on. And then you can combine it with again space repression life resistance stats whatever is fancy and you could use essence of loathing to get reservation efficiency suffix and then you can either craft more survivability with armor evasion or you could do plus one to aura gems and use your auras uh, plus one to aoe gems and use your auras in your helmet uh, either one will work and then we get to the last two upgrade steps which one of course is the rings you can get fractured rings, fractured stat, fractured resistance, and then roll for the other stats, resistance combination, so your resistances are kept, and you have like 1k omniscience, and then you can do suffix can be changed, veiled chaos, and hope to get a life unveil, and then craft mana cost, and you're good to go on rings, and for the belt, honestly, the belt really is just resistance belt, headhunter, mage blood, or stat belt, either is gonna work, and you should be good to go. Now this leaves us with the biggest upgrade. The most expensive upgrade, the biggest upgrade, if we ignore Headhunter or Mageblood, is going to be a really powerful bow. To get a powerful bow, we're looking something like triple T1 elemental stats with combined with attack speed and then a crit chance craft with stats because stats mean more omniscience. And then we would also need a good crucible tree this league, which would make the bow just a lot more insane. On the bow we can get crazy things like triple elemental damage or single elemental damage or double elemental damage. We can get attack speed, the so less global damage is whatever because all those crazy attack speed we're gonna have with this, with the setup I currently have, we're looking at 8 attacks a second, it's just gonna be absurd. Of course this is with Berserk uptime, but still it's gonna be a crazy amount of attacks. And then if you have Headhunter or Inspired Learning stacks on top, it's just going to be really quick. Trust me, it's it's really nutty absurd and just a lot of fun. But anyway, or you could go for... Oh, well, or you could go for double damage if you have less than 100 strengths, which you are guaranteed to have if you use Omniscience. And then the most extreme mod is Explicit Elemental Damage Modifier Magnitudes. This is just going to make this bow even more insane, even more damage, and you're gonna destroy everything with a bow like this. Now this is of course close to mirrored here, and at that point you might also want to swap to a fist bow, so this is the last step. This is a big upgrade to just finish the build, to make it all, uh, to round it up. Now this really just leaves us with flask. My recommended flask setup is a diamond, a jade, a granite, and a silver, a quicksilver later on, Early on, instead of the granite, you can use a silver flask until you have a brutal restraint and an amethyst flask until you have a progenesis. If you already have decent flask and don't need your life flask anymore but can't afford a progenesis, a great in-between step is a taste of hate. If you take a look here at of taste of hate, it does give you a good amount of additional max hit on physical, which is a really great thing to have. And of course, max hit on cold is also required to have. So this is an in-between step to get additional EHP out of this. As for prefixes, we want, except if you call if your mage blood, the master chest or better prefix to get charges when we are hit. If your mage blast, the increased effectiveness prefix. And for suffixes, movement speed is good, attack speed is good, armor is good, evasion is good, curse effect is good, and crit chance is good. Depending on what your build currently is lacking, I recommend the most always having curse effect, always having evasion, and then you can do movement speed, attack speed, armor, crit chance, whatever combi you fancy. But yeah, this should be all videos long enough. So with that being said, if I've left anything out, if I've forgotten anything or anything is unclear, feel free to ask. You can ask in the comment section, you can ask on Discord over PM or on, over the appropriate channel, or you can message me in-game and if I'm online I'm going to respond in-game, or if I'm not online I'm going to respond on any other uh, source as quickly as possible, uh, uh, any other way, not source. Anyway, as I'm going to respond as quickly as possible, and all that being said, hopefully this was informative, and you're going to have a great day and a lot of fun for the rest of the league. Goodbye.